I'm John o. Buchanan. Now, one thing that I love about working with Logic, and it's just as well I do love this, otherwise I'd have stopped working with Logic many, many years ago, is that, of course, there are so many routes to particular results. I could, for example, when it comes to writing a piano part, play it in live. I could record just the right hand and then create another duplicate track and add the left hand. I could draw those notes into a pattern sequencer. I could draw them one note at a time into the piano roll display. And ultimately, I'll get to the same place where I'll get a piano part, which I'm happy with, I hope. I'll keep working on it until I am. But ultimately, the important point is there are lots of ways to achieve that particular result. And of course, that's particularly true when it comes to more extended programming or mix uh, ideas as well, that whether we choose to add reverbs in channel or as an auxiliary are two different ways of being able to add spatial effects to our tracks and so on and so forth. There are lots of ways of getting to a particular result. And in recent weeks, what I've done is to look at a couple of ways of working with beat loops if what we want to do is to change the tempo of projects. So if you've got a piece of audio which is rhythmic, you want to bring it into a project, you either want to detect its tempo and make your new piece of audio conform to that tempo, or you want to make the rest of your track conform to the tempo of the loop, I've looked at various ways of being able to do that. And what we're going to do is take another look at that idea in another way. And of course, here is just another approach that you might choose to use if you decide you want to work this particular way. Now, this is inspired by a process that we refer to as working with Rex style loops. So some um, third party drum libraries in particular, I suppose I'm thinking about sort of Stylus by Spectrosonics in particular as one example, do an interesting thing when it comes to getting loops within that library to conform to the tempo of the project that you're working at. And the way that they do that is they take a pre-recorded loop or a program loop, and what they then do is to slice that loop up onto chromatic steps of a keyboard so that when they play back, rather than playing the whole of an audio file, they're literally playing tiny little slices. And of course, as a result of that, what you can do is to change the tempo and those slices will stay in the right positions, whether they're on a downbeat or the second 16th note of that downbeat, so on and so forth. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how that can be done. And there are a couple of ways that we could do that here within Logic. The first of those is to, cr um, to um, take the drum loop that I'm working with here and to take it into Logic Sampler. But this is the moment that I realise I haven't even played you this track yet, so I'll stop talking and I'll do that now. lounge vibes. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this drum loop, I'm going to drag it down here, and I'm going to take it left into Logic Sampler. And if I come to the Quick Sampler original, we know by now, because we're Logic experts, that what that means is that with a beat loop like this, Logic is likely to want to slice that. And what I mean by that is that it has done the kind of rec style thing that I was talking about. It has taken the whole of this beat loop, it's chopped it up, and it's assigned individual slices to different keys starting on C1. Is this C1? It is. Here is our first slice, which has got a kick drum in it and a little bit of top endy tambourine stuff. Then we've got the rest of the loop. And the great thing is that you can have a lot of fun playing these um, individual um, samples. Now, looking through the way that beat loops get sliced up, what sometimes happens, like it has here, I think, is that even though we're looking at a really sort of long um, view of this right now, I can see that actually not all of these slices are the same length. Uh, the same length. So, for example, I can see that this first slice here appears to be twice the length of what happens next. And I'm willing to bet that that's an eighth note and that this is a sixteenth. And you can sort of hear that as you listen through that this one has got more in it and lasts for twice the length of time as some of the others. So if that's an eighth note, sixteenth, sixteenth, I think that's an eighth as well. So what we can actually do is try and play this loop back. So 
So somewhere else there's an eighth as well because I got to the kick drum too soon. There it is. It's that one. I did it. See, that's just a lot of fun. Can we do it backwards? No, it doesn't work. Okay, although that's fun. So obviously one huge advantage of rec style loops is that of course we can just reprogram and chop things up and isolate individual hits. But it's also quite fun to practice your keyboard playing. I could just do that all day. You can go away for a little while if you want to. I'm just gonna have, fun. okay, no, all right. You're right. It's time to focus. But what I am going to do is to actually do it one more time because this time I'm gonna play that part in. I'm going to try and recreate exactly what I just did. Now it's also worth bearing in mind that by sampling this and turning it into MIDI, I now also have velocity style control over this in a way that I didn't before. The drum loop was just playing the drum loop. Now, I can play a different velocity for each individual slice, but I'm still so giddy that I'm actually able to play this loop live. The likelihood that I'm gonna get velocities to be completely even or to behave the way that I want them to is unlikely, but of course we can change that afterwards. Let's record it in. It's all right, wasn't it? I think Quantize is gonna be my friend here. So what we can do is to close this down, I've got my eighth note sliced right at the beginning, and I've got another one right on the end here as well. And of course, what I can do is that rather than quantizing it up here in the top left of uh, the region editor is I can also select all of these notes and I can quantize them here as well. So within the piano roll display, I can select 16th note and I can press Q and they're all going to just, um, you don't have to say Q like that, by the way, you can just say Q as opposed to Q, which I said a moment ago. But what we've now got is exactly those slices. Now, I want them all to lie last as long as they possibly can until the next slice takes over. So again, with them all still selected, I'm gonna hit this key command of shift and uh, backspace. And what that's gonna do is to make each note last until the next one takes over. This is our kind of forced legato technique. And what we've now got for anyone who's ever worked with a rec style loop before is a really familiar kind of ascending chromatic pattern where every single slice is now assigned to a particular um, space. Let's listen to it. It's all right. A couple of things haven't gone so brilliantly in the detection. There's a nasty little glitch at the beginning of beat, uh, bar two. Which I don't love, but of course, one of the other great advantages of working with rec style loops is of course, you can swap out any notes you want to. Sorry, there's gonna be more noise now. So I'm going to swap out the kick drum from the beginning of bar one to the beginning of bar two as well, and just to select that slice. What I'm also going to do is I am going to fix the um, dynamics so that every single note is exactly the same volume, and I'm going to make them all as loud as they can be. And the way that I've done that is just simply just add 64 units of velocity and then to hit control and N to normalize that so that every single note is now full volume. And that's sounding pretty good. Now that it's MIDI, of course, we have one huge advantage, which is that if I wanted to, making sure that my beat loop is now muted, the original version, I can change the tempo. So at the moment, we're working at 98 BPM. I'm gonna just take this down to let's say 94. Now you'll notice a couple of things. As I change the tempo, you'll see that the loop at the top is changing length. And the reason for that, it appears to be changing length, it's actually not changing in length, but its length relative to the tempo of my project is changing. In other words, if I take the tempo down, the loop isn't going to be long enough. It's not, it hasn't come from the Apple Loop Library, which means that of course, it's just going to be playing back at the wrong speed. So why isn't that true for the wah guitar parts and this, uh, the Burroughs guitar effects I one part? Well, they are Apple Loops. And as we know, Apple Loop content conforms to the tempo of our project. So this is a nice little uh, sort of version of understanding different types of audio file. Anything that hasn't come from the Apple Loop Library isn't sync to tempo is going to appear to change in length and isn't going to play back in time now. Remember that beat loop, if it was running live, would now stop early and it would be out of sync all the way through. But because this version of it down here is MIDI, that isn't true. And what that means is that I'm just in a position to just duplicate these. I'm just going to repeat them, literally repeat them. And hopefully these drums will feel pretty good at the new tempo of 94 BPM.
94 isn't that far away from 98. Let's really go there. Let's just take this down to 72 for a moment. Whew. So it doesn't sound amazing, but of course you wouldn't really expect it to. All of these slices have been taken from a loop at 98 beats per minute, and now I'm playing it back at, I can't do the maths, but it's, let's imagine 98 had actually been 100 beats per minute, it would be 72% of that speed. So it's going to be, well, you can do the maths, all right? I'm not here to do maths, I'm here to tell you about Logic Pro. You do the maths. Defensive maths position I've just taken up there. Okay, but you can see that obviously we're still getting a loop that is trying to play each of its slices in the right positions. So it's gonna help us, provided we don't get too far away from our original tempo. Interestingly, if we went the other way and made it faster, it might actually sound better. And of course, the reason it's going to sound a little bit better is because we don't get the gaps between each individual slice. The slice can only be a certain length, so of course, if I slow the tempo down, we're introducing a little bit of silence between each of them, whereas of course, if we get faster, that isn't true. So there we are, that's one way that we could do it. So there is another way that we can look at Rex style slicing without actually having to look at sampling at all. So I'm gonna mute this, and I'm going to unmute my drum loop. Of course, when we think about trying to get a drum loop like this to be in time or to have the potential to work at a different tempo, the obvious thing to do would be to use flex editing and to slice this region up. So the idea of that would be, we could simply just say, right, in slicing mode, I want logic to detect all of the transients so that when I change the tempo, those transient locations stay in position, taking their bit of audio to whatever the new tempo is. And again, I've made videos looking about how we might do that um, in, in, uh, in other episodes. So what I'm actually going to do here for a rec style approach instead, is I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. And what I'm going to do is to grab the scissors tool and I'm going to click on the first 16th note, which is here, right here. And what we're going to do is to hold down option at the same time to produce a multiple divide. And then I'm going to let go. And now my loop is going to have been chopped up in 16th notes all the way through. And if you think about it, that's a little bit like what I've just done here. Now, yes, a couple of those slices were detected as eighth notes instead. Now I've just got running 16th notes. But if every single slice is a 16th note, it should mean that if I change the tempo this time, rather than that loop appearing to get shorter, it doesn't because every single region re-triggers, if you like, at each of those individual slice points. So the gap isn't going to be at the end of the audio file, it's going to be in between each individual slice, which we can see. Now again, that's going to be a bit like our Rex loop, the MIDI version of that, when we made the tempo slower. We're going to be introducing silence between every single one of these slices, but I still think it might not sound disastrous. So this is playback, remember the original speed was 98 beats per minute, this is now at 90. Okay, so from a timing perspective, it certainly doesn't sound disastrous. What does sound disastrous is all of those individual ticks. Remember, we've chopped into this waveform. We've now got um, all little bits of audio file that are being chopped and starting in the middle of their cycles. And as a result of that, they're all going to be clicking. Let's see if we can get round that with a little fade in on the front and a little fade in on the end. Literally one millisecond in, two out. Well, that's not gonna be enough. So we could go further in that direction to see if this could work, but with longer fade in and fade outs.
And that's certainly getting rid of some of the clicks. But we know now that we've got gaps between each of these individual slices. So there is one more thing that we could try instead. What I'm going to do is to deselect the first of these individual regions where we know we've got a downbeat. And what I'm then going to do, keeping everything else highlighted, is I'm going to hit Control. And what I'm going to do is to go to Trim Start to Previous Region. Now, what that's going to mean is that all of the bits of audio file where, which currently start on a 16th note are now going to have their left edges adjusted back to the end of the previous region. So in other words, I'm filling in the gaps, not with the transients of those hits, but with whatever came just before them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that and all of those gaps are going to fill in. Now, I've got start and end fades on each of these individual regions. The next thing I'm going to do is to get rid of all of those. And instead, what I'm going to do is to select them all. For some reason, the first one, of course, it wasn't selected. That's why. That's why it didn't get rid of its fades. What I'm going to do is to select all of these. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an equal power crossfade. And what that's going to allow me to do is to put literally a little 10 millisecond crossfade between each individual slice. So I've filled in the gaps. And what I've done, hopefully, is to nevertheless preserve the downbeat of where every single one of those slices started. How does that sound? So I don't love what that's done to the hi-hat, but I do love what it's done to the lack of gap. So that, what that tells me is that if I was to adjust some of more of these points and to literally just select different locations between them, this might be a really effective way of me being able to turn this loop into something which was tempo locked. So in a sense, what we've done whether that's with this audio file here or by doing this over MIDI, is to look at what we refer to as Rex style processing, literally taking a drum loop and chopping it up into its component tempo lock slices. Remember, the moment there is something that tells either an audio file or a MIDI note, this is where you start. Of course, what that does is it protects us from tempo change because every single slice is locked to a particular moment within the track, a bar, a beat, a sub beat, all of that data is effectively built into where that note or event sits on the timeline. And as a result of that, we can change tempo and all of the slices will more or less feel like they're conforming to the tempo of your track.